Have you ever asked yourself, does my name really suit me? What does it mean? What do people think when they really hear it? Thanks to my dad's role in our local community, the two most common questions I got when I was a child were, are you Trevor Ranger's daughter? And what colour Power Ranger are you? It got a bit exhausting. I'm yellow, by the way. For the children of celebrities, it's no doubt even worse. And for the son of Winnie the Pooh author, A.A. A. Milne, this exacerbated it even further when his father decided to name one of the central characters of his books after him. It ended up being central to possibly his greatest struggle in life. Now with a new movie based on the books in cinemas and with his name emblazoned across posters everywhere, we're asking ourselves, what's in the name? You're watching Ranger on screen, and this is a story of Christopher Robin Milne. Christopher Robin Milne was born on the 21st of August 1920 to Alan Alexander and Dorothy Milne in London. As an only child to a fairly well-off family, he had the full attention of his nanny, who he affectionately called Nu. For the first few years of his life, they spent nearly every hour of the day together, as his parents were often in society. His formal name until the age of nine was Christopher Robin, but afterwards he was simply known as Christopher, which he said was the only name he really considered to be his. Informally in the family though, he was often called Moon, after how he used to pronounce Mill. When he was five, his father bought a farm near Ashdown Forest in East Sussex, which eventually became the inspiration for the Hundred Acre Wood. He loved to explore the rolling countryside full of streams, rivers and woodland there, especially with his father once new left when he was nine. When the first of the books Winnie the Pooh was published in 1926, he initially enjoyed the fame of being the namesake of the human in the story, responding to letters and feeling, in his own words, quite important. But all that changed when he went to boarding school and he faced the sneers and taunts of the playground bullies. It was during this time he started to come to believe that his father had got to where he was by climbing on his infant's shoulders, and he later said, filched from me my good name and had left me with the empty fame of being his son. He became determined to make a name for himself. It wasn't until the Second World War did he have much of a chance to experience what that might mean. His service in places like Trieste meant he encountered people unfamiliar with his famous father, and he could show his own merit away from his shadow. He returned from the war to finish his degree at Cambridge, then married his cousin and had a daughter, but this essentially cut him off from his parents, if not from outright anger towards them, then certainly from the independent lives they were all living. Christopher wrote some books of his own, but he vowed not to take any of the potential royalties and riches he could claim from his namesake. It seemed though that the most interesting subject he could write about was his own life, and when his last remaining parent, his mother, died, he wrote the autobiography The Enchanted Places. It allowed him to really examine what his parents had done to him as a child, by thrusting fame upon him and by, though not being worryingly absent, not being present enough to help him deal with these issues. He finally accepted the royalties, though for the sake of his disabled daughter Claire and the trust set up in her name. In fact, Christopher said that both the enchanted places and his daughter's birth and diagnosis allowed him to really accept his father's mistakes and learn from them. He was deeply devoted to her and her cause with the trust, and he reached the end of his life in 1996 claiming that he had had a good life. In some respects, this isn't the cheeriest of stories, really. A child is pushed into the limelight from a horribly young age, against their will, and is forced to spend the rest of their life in a love-hate relationship with their own name. Our names hold such meaning in our lives when you think about it. It tells us about our family history, of biology and inheritance. It tells us something of the minds of those who named us. It's drilled into us every single day and it follows us wherever we go and whatever we do and make in life. Our life's work and our art is attached to our name. And whilst many throughout time have gone to great lengths to break the tie, certainly in this modern day and age at least, it's near impossible to completely escape it. It seems even more important now than ever that we are able to come to terms with our name, to learn to be content with it and accept it, whether we change it or not, to see the future in it and not the past. So that even if we don't make a name for ourselves and achieve notoriety, we can still find peace with it, just like how Christopher Robin Milne did. So if you enjoyed this video, please do hit like and share it. If you create art in any form, then how do you see the connection between your name and your art? I'd love to hear from you. And if you're new here, it would be great to have you subscribe, so you can join us in our mission of highlighting the importance of music and film to the world.